Am I live? I am live. So it's, I'm live, it's not Memorex. So, uh, some of y'all re might remember that, but uh, some of you may not be old enough to remember live or Memorex. Well, good morning to everybody. It's uh, good to see everyone here today. It is, it is a beautiful, almost, summer day two more days and then it's officially summer just wait till we get to summer if you like our spring weather wait till you see what summer's like um it's going to be great but um you know fortunately the lord blessed us with a good good bit of rain a few weeks ago i guess he decided that was enough uh for a little while and and um i know there are folks in other parts of the country that would would have loved to have had some of that rain, so we should we should uh, count ourselves blessed uh, that we were able to receive that. I hope everybody has had a had a good week. Um, uh, I'm certain that the Lord has blessed you in some way this past week, and and that we have much to be thankful for. And so we are going to going to continue this morning. Our, our study uh, on evangelism. And, you know, and, and so far in our study to date, you know, we have seen that, that the early church was very active in, in evangelism. You know, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, Luke tells us, he says, Now those who were scattered went about what? Preaching the word. Everywhere they went, they were preaching the word, you know, and and it's interesting because that statement was made immediately after Luke says that there was a great persecution that arose against the church in Jerusalem. There were Christians who, you know, they were fearing for their lives, yet they took the time to share with others about the faith for which, honestly, they were being hunted down for. Now, you know, I hear us, I hear us say from time to time, we'll make, make a statement like, you know, I don't think things have ever been any worse than they are right now. Well, how much worse can it get, folks, than, than being hunted down for your faith? And yet, there they were. They were sharing the gospel everywhere they went. And so, you know, um, it's easy for us to maybe to have a pity party for ourselves. But you know what? Our God is greater than any, any challenges that we might face in this world. And, and so we, we always need to be remembering that, you know. The message that the early church shared with others was that, that God has an eternal plan for their salvation, which has been realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, last week we talked about the specifics of God's plan for salvation. Well, today we're going to take it a step further. And today we're going to talk about the first component in effectively following the command that we've been given by Jesus. Everybody knows what that is, right? Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Well, the first component that we're going to talk about this morning is, is what we're going to call public information. And, and we're going to we'll dig more into that in just a moment, but I do want to take just a second for us to, 
to, to pray together. I've asked Eddie, uh, he's going to lead us in a word of prayer in just a moment. I'd like to, to uh, see if anybody has any prayer requests that they would like for us to, uh, to pray about. Yes. Okay. In case you couldn't hear, um, um, Larry's brother, like that. Thank you. There we go. Um, but um, Larry's brother-in-law, Tom Clark, uh, needs our prayers. He's had some surgery, and um, and he would like for us to remember him in, in our prayers. Chase also mentioned to me before class that we need to continue to remember uh, the people of Ukraine. And then also, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, folks, uh, people in uh, in the country of Haiti at this time as well. Anybody else? I know we do need to remember um, Colleen Mahan um, and also the, the family of Colton DiValiti. Um, I don't know, some of you may or may not uh, know Colton. Colton was a young man who uh, who obeyed the gospel here, uh, but, uh, but he, was, uh, he passed away uh, Thursday morning. And um, and so there's some difficult circumstances surrounding that. And so uh, we do need to be remembering uh, Colton's family and also Colleen in our prayers at this time. Anybody else? All right, Eddie, now you can turn the mic on. Holy Father, as we come this morning, we are truly thankful for the day that you We're thankful for your church. Father, we ask that you be with the church and all the activities that we have and those that uh, not only here at Watermill, but uh, throughout the world. Father, give us that spirit of uh, evangelism. Help us look for open doors to uh, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that have not heard or do not understand. Father, there was uh, several mentioned this morning uh, for a prayer list, along with the one that is in the bulletin. We pray for those that are uh, uh, in dire need of uh, uh, health issues, and we pray, Father, for the ones that have lost loved ones. For those people in the world, Father, that are in uh, dire straits and danger that uh, of war and, and different things that are going on, we ask, Father, that you be with the leaders of the world and the countries and our country and help them to understand and see that uh, things should not be this way. Father, as we study this morning, uh, help us to understand and to look for open doors that will help us to spread your word the gospel of jesus christ be with us father as we continue in worship today and may we all have an understanding of your word be always forgiving keep us from the evil one and we pray this in the name of jesus christ and amen Thank you, Eddie. <clears throat> I'd like to ask everybody, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to start, we're going to read starting in verse 42 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Scripture says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. 
And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Notice this phrase here, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. <clears throat> you know, to me, one of the, the fascinating things about reading the Scriptures is that you, you read in, in different parts of the Scriptures and you, you read about events, real-life events that occurred. And, and I don't know about you, but I find myself at times when I'm reading those, thinking about, it's like, you know, man, what would it have been like to be there to see that happen? You know, I mean, what would it have been like to have been one of the children of Israel standing on the shores of the Red Sea and see the Red Sea part before your eyes? And then to turn back and see the Red Sea close down on the Egyptian army. What would that have been like? What would it have been like to have seen the, uh, a cloud, a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night outside your camp the entire time? that you were in the wilderness. What would it have been like to have been standing at the foot of the cross and seeing Jesus crucified? But this is another one of those moments where, to me, it's like, man, what would it have been like can you imagine what it would have been like to have been there, been part of the early church, been part of those believers there in Jerusalem? I mean, guys, i got to tell you, from what I read here, life was good. It don't get any better than that, does it? I mean, it sounds almost a little bit like, almost like heaven on earth. And so, so here these people were, you know, I mean, that would have been an amazing experience. But I want you to notice especially the phrase, having favor with all the people. Now, I don't know about you, but if you just let the media determine... The, the importance of your faith to the world. As far as the media is concerned, for the most part, we could go crawl under a rock and, and nobody would ever miss us. But when you look at, when you look at the early church here, you see, it says they were having favor with all the people. They, they were an important part of the community in Jerusalem at this time. Now, the word favor there is actually is, is taken from a Greek word that was used in the New Testament. It was most often translated as grace, but, but it means that which affords joy, or pleasure, delight, Sweetness, charm, loveliness, grace of speech. It also includes goodwill and loving kindness. So, so what does that tell us about the church in Jerusalem at this time? They were a people, they were known throughout the community, guys, as being a people of joy, as being people who brought pleasure to you when you were in their company. They were a people who were, they brought delight to people. They were sweet. They were charming. They were lovely. They were all of these things. How many of you like to be around people like that? Yeah. That's what we are. That's what we're called to be. And, and so... 
you know, what the, what the world would have us to think about who we are is completely wrong. What the Scripture says we're supposed to be is what we are. And we are that way because of Christ. Is because we, we are transformed into His image. And, and we, are, we, are, we are what the world needs. You know, the church was thought of by those living in Jerusalem as, as a positive presence in the community. When the community thought of the church, the church was a source of joy, of pleasure, delight, and loveliness. People looked at the church, and it was, it was sweet, and they were people full of goodwill. Church had a good image in the community. You know, they were, they were thought of as a group that, that the Chamber of Commerce, if there was such a thing in Jerusalem at that time, that the Chamber of Commerce would have considered to be one of the good things that was happening in the city of Jerusalem. The public perception of the early church was very positive. And so, in fact, you know, if you think about later on, a little bit further on in the book of Acts, you know, the public opinion regarding the early church was so positive that there were those who were opposed to their teachings that were hesitant to take action at, at one point. Remember when Peter and John are standing before the council? They had healed the man. The council had arrested them. They were standing before the council. Ultimately, the, uh, Luke tells us, he says, and when they, that is the council, had threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Why? Because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. So there, the public opinion about the church in the city of Jerusalem was so great that the Jewish leaders, they were scared to do anything. I hope it's obvious to us that, that the early church enjoyed what, what the business world today would, would call good public relations. And I think that should be instructive to us regarding the importance of a good positive image in our community for the church. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning is, uh, our, is how do we create, how do we develop a good positive image of Watermill Church of Christ in the city of Springfield, Missouri. Now, some questions for us to think about, and, and this is where you get to, get to answer, you get to talk instead of me. Question number one is this. What impression does our community have about us right now? No. Okay, Helen, Helen says, if you couldn't hear, she said, she said that a good many people, they have no impression because they don't know who we are. Anybody else? Okay, there, there would be some who, who would consider us, to, would think of us as Bible thumpers. What else? People. Okay, they, <laughs> there would be some out there who would who would think of us as being good people, because because of things that that we have done as a congregation in the community. But are there enough of those people out there who think of us to being that way? Okay, let me ask you another question. Do they know enough about us to even have an impression? 
Probably not. Okay. I don't think so. I was just asked yesterday. We were talking about the God and, and what, what He does for us. Their page. Want to know what church I went to? And I told the Church of Christ. And she said, "Oh." Then we just started talking. So they really don't know. They don't really want. <laughs> My opinion is this, is that I think by and large, most people out there in our community, they really don't know anything about the Church of Christ other than we are just like any other church here in town. Yeah, Julie. Sometimes you hear, especially when I'm doing like Know Your Bible stuff, we're known for the church, it doesn't have Okay, there, there would be, that's, that's probably the thing that, that most people, if, if you were to tell somebody, just if you were visiting with somebody in, in, the, in the line at Walmart, buying your groceries, and you started talking about church, and you told them you went to the Church of Christ, that would probably be the most likely thing that they would mention. Oh, you go to that church where they don't use instruments. Should that be the first thing that they think of when you say, I go to the Watermill Church of Christ? I don't think so either. I think it's important that we, that we speak where the Scriptures speak, that we remain true to the Word of God. But... You know, I'm not sure, the scriptures don't tell us this, but I'm not sure that the people in the city of Jerusalem, when they looked at the early church, that wasn't the first thing that they thought of when they found out that somebody was a member of the church there in Jerusalem. I think people knew of them because of what was happening with them as a group, the way they were growing, the, the, the deeds, the things that were being done that showed the power of the gospel at work. Last question. What are we doing now to help people of the community have a good image of us? We, are, we, do, have a few, we do have a few things happening in that way. And, and let, let me just say this, okay? Don't take this lesson as being, this is, this is all we have to do, or this is the most important part of, of what we do as a church, as the body of Christ here at Watermill, okay? There's way more to it than this, but this is, this is, a, this is a very important part. It's a very visible part shall we say, of what we as a church should have going on. But what are we doing now? Yeah, Julie. Um, we are, we're doing Know Your Bible. Okay? Oh. I do the phone, and it's something that's very rewarding at times because you're probably the only person that they'll come in contact. Okay, so... So Julie mentions that, that we, do, uh, we do participate in the Know Your Bible program, uh, which is a TV program that's on every Sunday morning. We do have the, uh, I guess it happened just last week, you know, feeding the, the homeless and underprivileged is a great thing that we have going on. You know, our young people, our young people this past week, they went and they helped, they went and helped at cross lines and they, Help them out in their warehouse, doing organization and things like that. You may not, I don't know if you saw it or not, some of you may not be on Facebook or Facebook or whatever you call it, but there was, you know, the cross lines, they put a picture out, said thank you to the Watermill Church of Christ youth for coming and helping us. That's a good thing. But by and large, folks, I think we, we have a little work to do in this area. Yeah, David. A lot of times we don't know when we say something to somebody, it may register in their mind 
and they think nothing about it for a year or two down the road. Then they look back and say, well, that individual told me, you know, or tried to tell me, yeah. and I didn't pay attention. But then they get it in their mind, okay, church and drugs. I don't know how many times I've had people to me. Yeah. Now you said something you did. You read part of my lesson. Um, you know, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. David was just saying that, and that sometimes it is the, the individual interactions that we have with people on a daily basis that can, can do as much for our public outreach in the community as anything. All right, so let me suggest kind of three broad areas where we can work toward building the good image in our community. And, but before I do that, remember, remember, what's our vision statement? What is our vision statement? It is welcoming, serving, and growing in Jesus. Welcoming, serving, and growing in Jesus. That, as, that should be somewhere in your brain rolling around every week, waking moment. Because when, when we developed, when that vision statement was developed, quite honestly, this passage of Scripture was part of the consideration. I hope you can see that vision statement in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. So three broad areas. First area that I would, I would call group opportunities. Some of these things, some of these things may seem to be somewhat superficial and not necessarily spiritual things, but nevertheless, they are they are things that we can be involved in as a group. They are things that we can serve the Lord in. A great example of what I'm talking about is the work day that we had here at the building. That was last Saturday, wasn't it? Seems like longer than that now, but I guess it was last Saturday. Brendan, why were we here to do that? It needed to be done. Okay, but why did it need to be done? Okay, thank you. It needed to be done... To, to make the building attractive. Guys, I know, I know. There's, there's a whole lot more to faith than our building. I, I get it. We have a lot more important things to, to share with people than doesn't our multi-million dollar structure look beautiful? But it's a starting place for a lot of people. That's a starting place. And, and, you know, so one of the things is, you know, we need to make the building attractive and inviting. This needs to be a place that is warm, that is welcoming. It doesn't have to be extravagant. but it at least needs to be warm, and it at least needs to be welcoming. It needs to be the kind of place that when people drive in, they're like, wow, these people care. We need to be able to use good signage to give people information. It's a little harder to do here in Springfield. But you go down in Ozark County, 
You go down in, in Arkansas, as you're driving into town, pretty, in most cases, somewhere close to the city limits sign, what kind of sign do you normally see somewhere close by? What's that? Okay, you see a welcome sign, but you see Church of Christ this way, right? Granted, it's a little more challenging to do that here in Springfield. But guys, it's still possible. Yes, ma'am. We were in Ozark County yesterday. Oh. I don't know how many signs we saw. <laughs> that way, whatever. Yes. You know, I mean, and, you know, I understand. I mean, they don't have to be big, extravagant signs, but, but they're still there. And, and even if people don't follow the sign, they still see the sign and say, oh, they still know there's a church of Christ in this town. You know, but the signs, they need to be in appropriate places. And they need to give a good impression. I don't know about you, I have seen on this um, digital sign that sits up here at the corner of um, Glenstone and Kearney. Surely everybody, everybody knows the sign I'm talking about. It sits right there uh, in front of the Double Tree Hotel uh, and everything. It's a big old digital sign that sits right there. I have seen churches advertise on that sign. Maybe we need to advertise on that sign. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there as, as a possibility. There are other places around town. I have seen other religious groups here in town have billboards along the highways. I'll be the first one to admit I'm not a huge fan of billboards. I like driving in states where they don't have billboards better than the states where they do. But nevertheless, I still see the billboard. Maybe, maybe we need to do something like that. I, guys, this is just, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not saying this is what we should do. Just ideas. If there's something that, that's brought up and you like, come to the elders and say, hey, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, Ann. Yep. And you can't believe how many Baptist people have been to my door. They are reaching out to me. I want to be with me. They said, well, you don't want to your church. Why don't you go with me to my church? Yep. I, and, and I think that's the way it should be done in America as well, okay? And we've started with group opportunities, but, and these are things that, that we may need to consider to be done, but Ann was talking about the need for us to be, be neighbors. And there's no, none of this other stuff's going to work if we're not doing that. No, no, billboards aren't going to make any difference. A nice, pretty building isn't going to make any difference if individually we aren't being the neighbors that we've been called to be, okay? But we need to treat visitors well from the moment they come to the parking area and make them feel welcome. Yeah, Greeley? People don't care. People don't know, say that again, people don't know, no. Okay, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, I finally got it. Yeah, Ruth. Um, well, I think there probably is, 
But I, I would submit, and in case you couldn't hear, Ruth was suggesting that we, that we have kind of a, a welcome wagon type thing where we get a list of people who are moving, in, uh, moving into town and, and we contact them that way. I would submit to you that we should all already be doing that. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of houses have been sold, bought and sold in Springfield, Missouri over the last couple of years. And I'm, I venture to guess that at least some of them have been close to you. Do we know those people? Have we met those people who bought those houses or are living in those houses now? I'm, I'm ashamed to admit I don't. But I don't think I'm alone in that. And so, so I, I totally agree with the principle. I, there may be other ways to, to, to achieve that, but, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, but when visitors come to our building, we have, we have deacons now who their responsibility is greeting. And their, their whole purpose is to make sure that our visitors are treated well, that they meet them, that we hopefully obtain contact information from them, and that we are following up with them after they have been here. So almost anybody you ever meet that has been to Watermill Church of Christ say, they're a friendly bunch of folks over there. But how good a job are we doing with following up after we've been such friendly folks? Great first step, but the work's just getting started at that point. Now, maybe we can serve the community in ways to build goodwill. <laughs> Benevolence is a difficult, can be a difficult thing. Um, you know, and, and uh, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of folks every day when I'm driving around town that at least have the appearance that they could use some benevolence. Whether it's deserved or not, I don't know. And, and that's, that's the challenge. And, you know, I don't know what the answer is with that. I, I actually think one of the best answers to that is, again, if you guys notice a recurring theme, if we are involved, more involved in the lives of other people, there are going to be some people that we know that are probably in situations in life where they could actually use some, some benevolence. And because we are involved in their lives, we have personal knowledge about their situation. And we can make a difference. The church can make a difference in people's lives in those situations if we know that that situation exists. But again, what does that take for that to be effective? Yeah, Julie. Where I live, there's a lot of people that do not have cars. And one of the things that we really could use, and something maybe the church can be involved with, is using that van like at the beginning of the month to take people shopping and to the bank because we, we don't have that. And I know I'm one of them. And another point when the church I grew up in Redland, we had a young, we had a woman, um, Mrs. Erickson, and she would look at the obituaries in the paper, and she would send a sentence to the to the family. Yep, those are those are good ideas, Julie. You know, other things, guys. I mean, as far as serving the community, I mean, we can can do. 
uh, like a, a community day of caring. Maybe we, we, we find somebody out there with a large amount of work that needs to be done. I mean, it could be a school building. I mean, I've, I've heard of religious groups paint, going in and painting the walls in, in school buildings, that kind of thing. There are other things that can be done. Um, service projects during holiday times to serve those in need. I'm going to mention it. We need to get back to hosting gospel meetings. We need to be hosting lectureships. We need to be having special series, lesson series. I know, and you mentioned gospel meetings, and, you know, and I, I think it was Barney heard talking about uh, in his lesson, he was talking about the, the old brush arbors where those things would go for a couple of weeks at a time. I think gospel meetings can still be effective. But you know what it takes for it to be effective? It's not good advertising. It's not a nationally renowned speaker. You know what it is? Word of mouth. It is us being the salt and light in people's lives that we've been called to be. Guys, notice a recurring theme here? A gospel meeting, we could fill this building if every one of us would invite the people that we come in contact with to come. Yeah, Ginger? Downer here. A downer? No, no, no. We don't want any downers today. Well, well, that's true. That is true. In case you couldn't hear, she said we can't even get all of our own members here for a gospel meeting. There's, there's truth in that. I can't, can't deny that. Can't argue with it. Yeah, David. Years ago, we used to do no Yep. I've been asked to leave because of that. You don't come back here. You're bothering me. You know, I don't want to be bothered. But still, the early church started with word of mouth. Do the same yep. Yeah, Linda. Yes. Those are good ideas, Linda. Real, real good ideas. I'm going to get whistle bit here. Individual opportunities, very quickly. We need to be involved in our communities, folks. I mean, we need, we need to be involved in service clubs. We need to be involved in, in Little League. We need to be coaching. We need to be uh, involved in ways like that. But the most important thing, as we've touched on several times over and over again, is we need to be good neighbors where we live. We just need to be good neighbors. You know, we need, to, we need to know enough about our neighbors to know that when somebody's sick or they've had a death in the family, that we're there to, to, to minister to them, to take them some food, to go pray with them. Watch their kids. If they have small kids that, that, that need to be... Uh, that don't need to be at, at a visitation or something like that. I mean, there, there are jillions of ways. 
public communications. There are tons of ways that we can do that. In fact, we're doing one of those right now. And it didn't hurt a bit, did it? We've got a live stream going on. There are lots of ways that we can do public communications. And guys, I don't know if you heard this or not. I'm going to conclude here. The, the percentage of adults in the United States who believe in God has officially dropped to 81% now. That is the lowest number that has ever been measured in the Gallup survey. And then, also there's a, a, a group called Making Caring Common. It's a project of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Last year, they came out with some survey results. They surveyed 950 Americans. And they said that more than one in three survey respondents, 36%, reported what they termed serious loneliness. In other words, they felt lonely frequently or almost all, of the, almost all the time or all the time. A staggering 61% of young adults aged 18 to 25 and 51% of mothers with young children reported serious loneliness. Folks, I take those numbers as being as being an indication, the world needs a church. The world needs a gospel. People are looking for purpose in their lives. They are looking for a place to belong. The church offers both of those. Our purpose is to serve God. And the place to belong is right here with y'all. And there are people out there who need us. We got to get out there. We got to get out there, guys. We got to put ourselves out. And where we start is individually right around our house is where it has to start at. So if, if the community of Springfield is going to have a stronger, more positive perception of Watermill Church of Christ, it starts with you. It starts with you being the Good Samaritan.